There are so many of them, and they are so exuberant, the Biafrans. Even the refugees sing, especially when they have just been told their homes have been recaptured and they can go back to them. They sing when they get their daily subpoena. They sing when they work. They sing when they practice army marching. No guns, no shoes, but a song that goes something like, Thank you, General Ojuku, for giving us the medicine with which to fight our enemies instead of being murdered in our beds. A kind of spirit that has kept them going through two years of starvation and defeat. A spirit that arises partly out of fear. Fear expressed by Chief of Staff Philip Effian. I am sure that if the Nigerians can control our uh, links with the outside world, our radio links and our air links, so that we are completely cut off and they are in control of everything here, I am quite certain that they will really go to town and murder everything in sight. A spirit and a self-confidence that has kept trucks rolling somehow armies growing somehow, life organized somehow, in a nightmare period in which one out of ten, at least, of all their countrymen have died of starvation. This is Lagos, capital of all Nigeria except Biafra. It is difficult to imagine that this is the headquarters city of a military government mobilized to fight a bitter civil war. But there is hardly a uniform in sight. The fact is that Nigeria is not really mobilized. Only a few thousand square miles of a nation more than a hundred times that big are touched by that war. There are no shortages. There is no starvation. In the vast northern stretches of Nigeria, the Muslim prayer day is consecrated as it has been for centuries. And there is not a soldier to be seen. Eight hundred miles away at the University of Ibadan, the student body last week was preoccupied with final examinations. There is no draft in Nigeria, and almost none of the students have volunteered. Only in the war-wrecked ghost towns of the East could I see palpable evidence of a country fighting for its life. And not one Nigerian in a thousand has seen this. In all of Lagos, the only building dressed for war is the military headquarters. And throughout the country, plaintive advertisements in government newspapers and radio stations plead with Nigeria's citizens. If you don't fight the war, they say, nobody else will. But the 35-year-old Nigerian chief of state, General Yakubu Goan, says there is a good reason why Nigeria does not go all out in the civil war. We're fighting our own brothers, our own friends, our own probably colleagues that we were trained together. Now, I accept them as my people. I don't call them enemies. They're not my enemies. That's why, in fact, we don't use the word enemy. We use the word only rebels against you know, Ojuku and his clique and those of that fight for him, but not against all the Igbos. Now, therefore, we've got to do, uh, we must not do anything that is going to make it impossible for us to reconcile in, in, at the end, or it will make the winning of the heart difficult in the end. Let's pause now for some of the history behind this bloody war. It is said, though no one knows for sure, that one of every four black men on the African continent is a Nigerian. There were 55 million of them before the war. Nigeria was a creation of British colonialism. At the turn of the century, Britain carved out the richest area in West Africa, lumped together 250 tribes, each with its own culture, its own history, and arbitrarily called these people Nigerians. Of those tribes, three were dominant, the Hausas, most numerous Muslims in the north medieval, lagging behind the others in education and commerce. The Yorubas in the West, animists and Christians, the first educated. And the Evos in the East, where Christianity is now strongest. 
Some say the Igbos were the most backward, but in the last quarter century, with the aid of European missionary education, the Igbo overtook the others and became the most powerful economic group of all. But the Igbo also wanted political power. He resented the strength of the houses and Yorubas, who, since Nigerian independence in 1960, had run the country and grown corrupt. Riding a wave of popular discontent, Igbo and other military officers in 1966 succeeded in a coup d'etat. They executed key non-Ebo politicians and several of the top non-Ebo military officers. For a while, it seemed the country applauded the coup. But once in power, this new ebo dominated government was felt to be guilty of the same corruption as the previous government. Additionally, Igbo merchants and civil servants all over Nigeria began showing a newfound arrogance and sense of superiority, building a resentment that culminated in a wave of terror against the Igbo. Estimates of the number of Igbo massacred in northern Nigeria range from 7,000 to 30,000. Surviving Igbos abandoned their homes and businesses. Millions of them fled to the Igbo heartland in the east. There, led by the charismatic Ojukwu, army officer, son of a wealthy Igbo family, they seceded, proclaiming Biafra an independent nation. To begin with, Biafra claimed this corner of Nigeria, which included territory containing several minority tribes, some of whom did not support the Igbo cause. Following Biafra's secession in 1967, Nigeria invaded from the north. Biafra struck back across its own boundaries, conquered and held for a while territory in federal Nigeria. But in two years of war, federal Nigerian troops have whittled down Biafra from over 50,000 square miles to a little more than 3,000. The fighting in this war is sporadic. There are few fixed military positions, no real front lines, many hit-and-run raids by both sides, and an occasional big battle for a city or a road junction. This is Nkwalo Junction, right now about three miles behind the furthest advance of Biafran troops to the south. There was heavy fighting here in early May as the Biafrans retook the town. Okwala Junction is 25 miles from Port Harcourt, a major seaport and refinery city the Biafrans want back. The Biafran troops we found at this road junction were a ragtag collection looking more like irregulars than the frontline soldiers of the 14th Division who are currently engaged in Biafra's most successful offensive of the war. How the Biafran army succeeds, armed as it is with an odd lot collection of weapons, is a puzzle. Some at the front carry communist-made AK-47s, like those used by the Viet Cong. Some only World War I bolt-action antiques. Others, modern British semi-automatics. And their pride and heaviest weapon, a 30 caliber machine gun just captured from the Nigerians. Much, in fact, of what the Biafrans are now using against the Nigerians, they have taken from them. One military man up here told me, not totally as a joke, that Biafra now looks upon the Nigerian army as its quartermaster general. And if the Nigerian army runs on beer and bullets, the Biafran army lacks both, with ammunition constantly in critically short supply. These troops had advanced six miles in less than a week. Then, practically out of ammunition, were forced to stop on the road to Port Harcourt until more supplies trickled down to them. One of this army's other problems is staying large enough to continue the fight against Nigerians. When Biafra seceded in 1967, it had fewer than a thousand men under arms, and those mostly officers and clerks. Now it has been built up to between 45 and 60,000, the exact number, a military secret. Volunteers made the original army build-up easy. Now conscription of virtually all able-bodied young men is underway. And in a former school compound, we found recruits drilling, marching in the mud to the improbable tune of Margie. These new soldiers are also taught the rudiments of jungle warfare and ambush to be used against an enemy which holds most of Biafra's major cities, several vital road links, but not too much of the countryside. The training is basic, but effective. You're going to stop us right by the shoulder here, and we want to defend it. Go. Go. 
And here I met a young trooper, a very young trooper in the Biafran Army. How old are you? I'm 10 years. 10 years old. Yes. Do you know why Biafra is fighting? Biafra is fighting for survival, sir. Is it going to win? Yes, sir. His spirit, in that of this tattered army, driven by fear of genocide, which may or may not lie ahead if they lose, plus what must be massive ineptitude on the part of the Nigerian army, is the most probable reason that this war of unequals now has gone into its third year. Nigeria before the war had an army of just 6,000, and they were professionals, their officers trained by the British. They served with distinction as part of the UN force in the Congo. But then Biafra declared its secession, and all of the Igbo officers and men, some of the best, left to become the nucleus of Biafra's army. <laughs> In just the past two years, Nigeria's army has exploded to 14 times its original size, to 85,000 men. Recruits who used to get six months of training now get a mere six weeks. They are volunteers, most of them illiterate, just out of the bush, with little sense of nationhood. Their leaders tell them that they are fighting for one Nigeria, but that does not. It cannot have the same urgency for them that mere survival has for the Biafran. A Nigerian soldier may volunteer because he needs a job, or because army life appeals to him as the good life. Besides his uniform and the prestige that goes with it, he gets a comfortable ration of beer and cigarettes. And the pay, at $40 a month, is not bad. His leaders are not aggressive. Most military observers credit what success the Nigerian army has had so far chiefly to their lopsided superiority in firepower furnished by the British and the Russians. It is said only half in jest. The Nigerian army has so much firepower that they use ammunition as a defoliant. Nigeria's planes, MiG-17s and Aleutian bombers, were bought for cash from the Russians who want to get a political foothold here. Most of the planes are flown by Egyptians, who are characterized as wary of anti-aircraft fire, therefore less than enthusiastic about going after military targets. That, it is suggested, is one cause of the high civilian casualties in the air raids on Biafra. But the war has been bloody on both sides, and inept and unaggressive though they may be, the Nigerian army, in two years of sporadic fighting, has suffered heavily. They will not release official casualty figures, but an army doctor told me that 8,000 Nigerian soldiers have died, and perhaps another 25,000 have been wounded. The military has just 11, 11 army doctors for its 85,000 men. A severe head or body wound in the field means almost certain death. The Nigerian army gives no medals in this civil war. I asked the commander-in-chief, head of state, General Yakubu Gowan, why? I will hate tomorrow when the war is over and we sit around the table with an Igbo officer and he asks, what is that medal? And I say, it is the Okiwi medal, it is the Umahi medal, it is Onicha medal, it is Inugu medal, it is Potakot medal, and uh, that this is the war for, uh, the, you know, the war against, you know, the Igbos. They said we hate to sort of, uh, you know, sort of have that sort of feeling because it will make the chap feel as though, uh, you know, he's a conquered sort of person. The war, says go on over and over, is not to conquer the Igbo. It is to bring the Igbo back into one Nigeria. One of the two reasons, along with increased military effectiveness, that Biafra is still alive, is the fact that not nearly so many people are starving as were last fall. And the reason for that is the emergency airlift sponsored by Catholic and Protestant churches and the International Red Cross. At feeding centers like this, three million people, a third of Biafra's population, is fed one meal a day, six days a week. At best, it is a subsistence feeding just enough to prevent starvation. A ball of cornmeal laced with powdered milk. Perhaps some vegetables. A small piece of fish. 
and some soup. All handed out early in the morning to millions of people who would have died were this food not flown in nightly to several Biafran airstrips carved from the jungle. While the relief flights have reduced dramatically the number of children and adults starving to death, down perhaps to 600 a week from the high of several thousand a week last year, the dying continues. In clinics like this all over Biafra, youngsters in the final stages of severe malnutrition still die, as did several of these during our week in Biafra. Not enough food is being flown in not enough grown, and for many, what there is, is now just too late. This bush clinic is run by Father Kevin Diani. After 14 years in Africa, he and fellow missionaries were ordered to leave Biafra in 1967 by the Irish ambassador. They stayed, as did Protestants of other nationalities, and they, in the main, have been responsible for keeping Biafra from starving to death. How hard has the war been on the Igbo civilian population? How many people have died, would you think, Father? I would think that we've gone into the second million. I am not a statistician, and it's very hard to talk about millions, but I, I think that it's, uh, uh, according to the experts here, I think that they've gone into the second million. And uh, they have suffered incredibly. And this is the one uh, big argument that I would put forward as one of the reasons why they, they, are, they want to survive on their own and they want to live on their own. They could not have suffered so long and so much without having a purpose. To augment the relief airlift, Biafra has formed a second army to work the land. It is planting wherever it can. Here in virgin territory where no crop ever grew before, Young men employed by relief agencies and the government are breaking ground to plant corn, rice, yams, melons, anything else that might grow. And this, like everything else here, is conducted with spirit, emotion, and beauty. <laughs> It's clear that as long as this war goes on, the starvation will too. Any break in the relief airlift, I was told, any crop failure in the next few weeks, and graveyards like these that dot Biafra and contain the bodies of the young and innocently dead will multiply. There is a bitter irony in this billboard which is seen all across Nigeria. For Nigerian babies have not been healthy babies. Even before the war, disease and malnutrition regularly killed one out of three children there. And Nigeria's leaders ask, where was the world's solicitude, where was the church's succor before Biafra? General Gowan, a Christian, is sensitive to the charges of mass starvation. I have got nothing to hide. My conscience is clear. I've got moral standard. God knows that we have no intention whatsoever to starve any Biafran children or to commit genocide against anybody. This war was forced on us and it has got to be fought for the sake of the country, for the sake of the millions of people in this country. But those millions of Nigerians are not thinking mostly of the war. Their chief preoccupation is commerce, and war or not, business booms. The Lagos docks are choked with ships from around the world bringing goods for the huge consumer market here, and taking away for sale overseas Nigeria's palm oil and peanuts, its animal hides and cocoa, and it's tin. 
But the real prize in Nigeria, the overriding reason the major powers focus on this country's conflict, is Nigerian oil. Already, they are the 12th largest producer in the world. Conceivably, they will eventually become fifth or sixth. The British produce most of it. A United States company, Gulf, the rest. It is Nigerian oil, much of it under territory that Biafra claims, that is said to trigger France's last-ditch aid to Biafra. It is oil that Nigeria is counting on to finance the reconstruction when the war is done. At the time of Nigeria's independence from Great Britain nine years ago, oil profits netted about seven million dollars annually to the federal government. This year, in spite of the war, the Nigerian government will collect almost three hundred million dollars in revenue. The Afrans admit it is an oil war, at least in part. They know their country sits above what may be the richest oil reservoir in the world. And it is the oil, plus the ingenuity of the evil, that has kept Biafra running. In refineries, backyard stills like this, small, crude, hidden away in the bush, Biafra produces gasoline, kerosene, diesel fuel in surprising amounts. There are 50 to 100 of these refineries all over Biafra, and they now produce enough fuel to keep the army, the church relief operation, the government, and the civilian population on necessary wheels. There is traffic on the roads, and on occasion it is heavy, which surprised me. Troops and food moving. No shortage of transport of any kind. And that is part of the staggering normalcy with which life in Biafra goes on. In spite of two years of war, in spite of the loss of all its major cities, in spite of the death of more than a million people in 24 months, life in Biafra goes on. Markets like this one at Orlu, where 40 died last year, were bombed and strafed by Nigerian jets. But the markets were moved back into the bush, and daily commerce goes on. Food is still on sale, but in smaller quantities than in pre-war days. Basic services are still being sold for Biafran pounds. Wartime inflation has forced prices up. Clothing costs have tripled. Cigarettes sell for $20 a pack. Inflation aside, life in Biafra is so normal that even the judicial system has not faltered. Back in the bush, a civil trial to settle a land dispute. Hardly the thing we thought we'd find in a supposedly defeated country about to be overrun. And in areas just recaptured as the Biafran army pushes south again, in cities like Oware, where damage was heavy after obviously heavy fighting, the business of cleaning up and putting things right started almost as soon as the area was secure. Oweri, after being in Nigerian hands for seven months, is expected to be a fully functioning city in a matter of weeks, making room for refugees who already are starting to return, and for whom the first mass of thanksgiving in the unfinished and war-damaged cathedral was an event of paramount importance. He had to suffer, first of all, from the year with the bombing and the strafing that left so many of our civilians dead. They had to fight at the front where so many of our young men have died. We have become most of us refugees. We have lost our property. We have nothing of our own. That suffering we have known for the past 20 months. That suffering we still have. But we live in hope that that Holy Spirit will come down on us, that he will enlighten the minds of our leaders, and that they will lead us to a true and just and lasting peace. In the territory the Biafrans evacuated as they fled before the federal troops, the abandoned buildings echo only to the wind. And the cities in the Igbo heartland, once the most densely populated area in all of Africa, have been emptied of their people. Emptied by the Igbo's fear of the federal Nigerian. No matter the federal government's assurances that they will be safe, the Igbo's flee. They have gone into the bush, 
leaving their homes shattered by shell fire. Their schools barren of students. Their government headquarters in the once flourishing administrative capital of Enugu, ghostly quiet. Nothing is left here now but a few scattered refugee camps. And the federal troops who garrison the eerie and deserted miles of road and bush. At Abakaliki, a district administrator stayed behind. His mother and father are with the Biafrans, but he and his wife, Ibos, cast their lot with the federal Nigerians. A divinity student, he told me that the Ibo, the Biafran, feels it appropriate that he be likened to the Jew. If we are to be likened to the Jews as we like to be, it means we are a chosen people. We are the people with the grace of God in Nigeria. Sorry, this is not being proud or selfish. Now, if we lose the trend, which is bringing, making others realize the goodness in surrendering ourselves to God and in living according to God's law, which is love, it is then that we fail. And this is what happened. With our drive and our punch and our talents, we tended to put what we should have put first last, which is God. And we put material things, money, houses, positions, human esteem, we put them first and put God last. And this is why the punishment has come. As it has come in the history of the Jews. Each time they failed and forgot their God, they were punished by a war on them, as we are being punished now by a war on us. Nowhere was the war's punishment more devastating than in the commercial city of Onitsha. In this comfortable and sophisticated town perched on the east bank of the Niger River, Thousands of Igbo merchants built their fortunes by hard work. The Igbo is a commercial man, and this market at Onitsha, the biggest market in all West Africa, was a monument to his enterprise. When the British author Elspeth Huxley came here, she wrote, anything can be bought in this market from an elephant to an admiral's uniform. There is no difficulty about nylons or about raw meat, whiskey, gold earrings, avocado pears, Irish turkeys, penicillin, or anything else. When the Biafrans left here, they burned the market. What the Igbos failed to burn, the federal Nigerians took care of. Not a building in Onitsha is unscarred. The federal troops inherited just a skeleton, a ghost town. And in the city plaza lies the fallen statue of Namdi Azikwe, Nigeria's first and only president, himself an Igbo. He now lives in London. This bridge across the Niger River was the link. It was also a dividing line between the Igbo East and the rest of Nigeria. The Biafrans, the Igbos, blew it up to keep it from serving federal Nigeria. The bridge can be repaired. But what about the bitterness between the Igbo and his countrymen. Reconciliation and reunification seem at the moment impossible. At least that's the feeling we got in Biafra. The people simply believe that if they surrender or lose, they'll be killed. Biafra's leaders told me their rock-bottom condition for peace is a referendum in the disputed areas to be guaranteed by some third party. But many observers feel that Biafra would come to the peace table without that referendum if she felt her military position were better and the safety of her people guaranteed. I came away from Nigeria convinced the genocide is not on the line of her leaders or her people. They know they need the talents of the Igbo and they want them back. They fear an independent Biafra on their flank as a potentially hostile state with expansionist yearnings. And it must be said there is growing impatience among Nigerians now at the slow pace of the war and one would expect that pace to pick up in coming months. They've been stung by the recent air raids of Biafra's miniature Swedish volunteer air force, and they'll make an all-out effort, General Gohan told me, to take out the Biafran airstrips from which those planes fly and into which supplies and weapons for Biafra are flown each night. To end this war soon, we conclude it will take a genuine effort by the major powers, perhaps by the United Nations. It will be up to the countries now supplying both sides with arms to stop. 
It will be up to someone to guarantee the safety of the evil after a truce and as the negotiations begin. The United States conceivably could take the lead because this country has studiously avoided any military involvement in the war, aiding Biafra's relief airlift while backing Nigeria politically. But there seems little disposition on the part of the United States or the other major powers to step in. Their attention is focused elsewhere. 